Growing up in this corner of PJ, everyone knew about the old corner house perched ominously on the hill. Overgrown and overshadowed by the sprawling branches of old trees, it seemed to brood under the weight of its own dark history. The initials SJ on the rusting gate served as the only clue to its mysterious past. As children, we would dare each other to approach the gate, but none of us ever touched it, none except Arif. I remember the day after Arif's visit to that house vividly. He arrived at my doorstep in the early hours of the morning, looking as if he had been chased by ghosts. His eyes were wide, his hands trembled, and his voice was barely a whisper as he recounted what he had experienced. The tale he told was one of such eerie and harrowing detail that it has haunted me to this day. Arif had always been drawn to the house, more than any of us. That night, pushed by a curiosity that bordered on obsession, he had finally made up his mind to explore it. He described how the gate had groaned under his touch, its cold metal sending shivers down his spine as he pushed it open. The path to the house was overgrown, the air thick with the smell of rot and decay. The once grand building now stood derelict, its windows like dark watching eyes. Inside, Arif's flashlight pierced the gloom, revealing remnants of hurried departure, furniture draped in dusty covers, toys left abandoned on the floor, a book left open as if waiting for its reader to return. But it was on the third floor that Arif encountered the heart of the house's darkness. He found himself drawn to the master bedroom, where he slid open the balcony door and was hit by a cold, otherworldly wind. There, the past came alive before him in a ghostly scene. He witnessed the spectral figures of a man and his wife, embroiled in a furious argument. Arif had watched, heart pounding in his chest, as the tragic scene unfolded before his eyes on that ghostly balcony. The spectral figures of the man she called Suresh and his wife were locked in a fierce argument, their forms shimmering against the moonlit backdrop of the old house. Suresh, a stern and imposing figure even in death, gestured wildly, his face contorted in anger and desperation. His wife, countered with equal fervor, her expression one of deep despair and anguish. The argument reached its harrowing climax when, overwhelmed by sorrow and cornered by her husband's relentless ambition and dark dealings, she stepped back, her eyes wide with a cocktail of fear and defiance and threw herself off the balcony into the abyss below, her form dissolving into the night before it ever reached the ground. Before Arif could begin to comprehend what led to her extreme actions, the scene continued in its horror. Driven by a mad resolve to continue his dangerous pursuits, Suresh ignored the pleas of his servants, who feared the dark energies that seemed to engulf the house. With a cold dismissal of their concerns, he forced his own children into the same grim fate. One by one, Arif watched as the innocent spirits of Suresh's children were coerced to the balcony, their small forms hesitant and trembling. Their father, his figure now a looming specter of doom, ushered them forward with a chilling determination. Despite their silent screams and ghostly tears, they, too, vanished over the railing, their spirits swallowed by the darkness that had claimed their mother. Finally, with his family gone and his home cursed by his deeds, Suresh stepped over the edge himself, his spectral form fading into the night as if devoured by his own remorse and the shadows of the house. The servants, powerless and dismayed, eventually dispersed, their spirits lingering in the corners of the house, forever mourning the family they could not save. As Arif stood there, witnessing this macabre ritual, the weight of the tragedy pressed down upon him, a sorrow so profound it threatened to pull him into the spectral dance of death he had beheld. When he finally fled the house, Arif said the voices of the dead followed him, whispering, you forgot us, into the night. From that day onward, he was never the same. The voices invaded his dreams, whispering relentlessly, eroding his grip on reality. 
Despite all efforts to help him find peace, counselors, therapists, medication, nothing silenced the whispers. Eventually, his family, with heavy hearts, decided he needed more care than they could provide and admitted him to a mental care facility. I visited him when I could, watching helplessly as my vibrant friend faded into a shell, haunted incessantly by the voices only he could hear. Then, ten years later, the news came that chilled us all. Arif had vanished from the facility. Despite extensive searches, no trace of him was ever found. It was as if he had been erased from existence. The mystery of his disappearance consumed me. Driven by a mix of fear and unresolved loyalty, I found myself standing before the SJ house, its gate inexplicably unlocked. I reached out, half expecting to feel the cold hand of fate grasp mine, but I hesitated. Memories of Arif's tormented face, the fear in his eyes as he recounted that night, held me back. I couldn't bring myself to enter. Instead, I stood there, staring into the dark windows of the house, wondering if Arif had returned to the place that had first ensnared him. Was he still wandering those haunted halls, forever trapped in a loop of spectral agony? Or had he found some semblance of peace in the embrace of the house's dark heart? As I turned away, leaving the gate as it was, unlocked and inviting, I felt a chill wind brush past me, carrying with it a faint whisper, You forgot us. It was the same plea Arif had heard, the same haunting refrain that had driven him to madness. It seemed the house wasn't done with us yet. Now, late at night, when the world is silent and the barrier between past and present grows thin, I hear it too. The whisper comes to me, a soft, sorrowful echo of the house's tragic history. And I wonder if I am destined to follow in Arif's footsteps, slowly being drawn into the same cycle of whispers and shadows that claimed him. It's a thought that keeps me awake, staring into the darkness, listening for the soft voices that might one day seek to claim me too. The story of the SJ house and its tragic spirits has become a somber legend in our community, whispered about in the same hushed tones once used to dare each other to approach its gate. It's a warning, perhaps, about the dangers of delving too deeply into places forgotten by time but not by sorrow. I find myself walking past the hill some evenings, my gaze inevitably drawn up towards the looming silhouette of the house against the skyline. It stands there as if outside of time, a monument to its own enduring mystery. Each time the wind shifts, rustling the leaves and whispering through the open spaces, I can almost hear the faint cries of its lost souls, and the quieter, more insistent voice that sounds suspiciously like Arif's, mingling with them. People often ask why the house remains standing, why it hasn't been torn down or exorcised of its ghosts. But perhaps some places are meant to stand as reminders, their very presence a testament to the past that shaped them. Or maybe, in a more practical sense, the fear is too great, the story is too chilling for anyone to dare attempt reclaiming it from the spirits that reside there.